This <laughs> is a Bible test. Greetings, everyone. <laughs> I have a challenge for you. Uh, question. Have you proven what you profess to believe? Proven to yourself from your Bible. So many times I hear, my pastor says, or I'll ask my minister. No. We are talking about your salvation, and the Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not something you want to take someone else's word for. I've heard many times, and it's been said many times, don't believe me, believe the Bible. So how to begin? Well, my suggestion is that you get a good Bible, either a King James Version or a New King James Version, uh, but one that is not a paraphrased Bible where someone else will interpret the words for you and put it into their own words. And there are Bibles out there like that. You want to check the Bible in the front of the Bible that it is diligently compared to the original translations of the Hebrew and Greek. And a good concordance. And I would recommend the strongest strongs 21st century concordance. A concordance has every word in the Bible, every place where it's used in the Bible, and a number keyed to the Greek and Hebrew dictionary in the back of the book so you can see for yourself the original meaning of the original translation. Just make sure if you have a King James Bible, you have a King James concordance, or you'll be looking up different words and it'll cause you confusion. So make sure they match. You need to know you cannot get all the information on a given subject from one verse. That's not the way God works. That's not the way he teaches. And God is the teacher. We're going to begin in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 9. And he says, Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Those just weaned from the milk? Those just drawn from the breast? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You need to become a detective, searching for clues to find the answer. Just like what maybe one of your favorite uh, TV programs for the last decade have been the uh, CSI programs, and there's several of them. They just don't go to a crime scene and say, okay, there's the body. Uh, that will tell us everything we need to know. No, they search for clues all around the crime scene. And they work out in a perimeter, and they search, and they look, and they complement each other. And there's more than one person, and they just continue to search. You, know, you might want to uh, compare it to maybe one of your favorite uh, mystery novels where you have to search for clues and keep compiling the clues until you find the answer that you're looking for. And in the Bible it will be here a little and there a little. In Matthew chapter 13 the disciples had a question for Jesus. Jesus had been speaking to big crowds. One occasion he spoke to 5,000. The disciples came to him in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom in heaven. 
If you believe God is calling you, then God wants you to know the truth. And if God is calling you, it isn't to go to heaven and retire. It is for basic training to qualify to rule with Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God when Christ returns to this earth at the last trump. So, I challenge you to take this test and prove to yourself if what you believe agrees with the Bible. I'm assuming, of course, that you believe in God and creation. For laws to exist, we need a lawgiver. Uh, we have laws in our country, and they exist because the Founding Fathers wrote a constitution, and they implemented certain laws. We have a law called gravity. Well, someone had to create that law. It didn't just happen. We don't just happen. We create after our own kind. A man and a woman make a baby human. Cows make cows. Horses make horses. That's the way it was designed from the beginning all the way back in Genesis chapter 1. The Bible is the Word of God. It is our owner's manual issued by the manufacturer to tell us what to do, what not to do, when to do it, how to do it. And just like your car's owner's manual tells you what kind of oil to use, what kind of gas to use, what kind of coolant to use, the Bible even tells us what kind of fuel to use. It tells us what to eat and what not to eat. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 4, as he was contending with the devil, in Matthew 4.4 4, he says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Well, for us to do so, to live by every word of God, then God had to preserve his word for us to know what it is. The Bible can be proven to be the Word of God in many ways, and one of them is prophecy. The prophet Daniel writes during the time of Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. History records the acts of Nebuchadnezzar, and you can research any history book of world history, and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon is even considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Well, contained in the book of Daniel is God's intervention in the life of this heathen king. But Daniel also gives prophecies and dates that can be verified by history as true. The fall of Babylon, the rise of the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greco-Macedonian Empire, Cleopatra and Egypt, and the Roman Empire and its rise and fall right down to the end time that is just ahead of us. Even our Savior Jesus Christ gives his stamp of approval on the book of Daniel as being true by quoting from it as he would not quote from false testimony claiming to be the Son of God. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom and notice it's the gospel of the kingdom. It's not some other gospel about some other thing. It's about the kingdom of God. That is the message that Christ brought. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in a housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, 
those days will be shortened. Bad times are coming. So with that in mind, let's take a test. John 3.16. Everyone knows John 3.16. You see it on billboards. You see it, signs being held up at sporting events. John 3.16. Everybody knows it. But nobody believes it. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But that's not what people believe. When they read it, their mind tells them something different. Their mind tells them that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not live forever in hell, but live forever in heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. It says, perish. So, what does God say? What does he mean, perish? Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14. Then death and Hades, which is the grave, just a Greek word for the dead, the place of the dead, the grave, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Anyone not found written in the book of life, everlasting life, will be cast into the lake of fire. At the end of the Old Testament, in the book of Malachi, in chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. And all the proud, yes, and all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. He makes the point of saying, leave them neither root nor branch. What does he mean by that? Well, I remember when I was a kid, and I used to help my mother pull the weeds out of the garden. She would say, make sure you get all the way down and get out the whole root, or it'll come back. And what God is saying, there's not going to be a root. There's nothing left. You're going to be uprooted. You're going to be cast aside. You're going to be burned up, destroyed, it ceased to exist. That's what he means by perish. Gone. Forever. Well, what about the first death? What happens when we die? Do we go to heaven? Well, what does God say? John chapter 16. John chapter 16 and verse 28. Jesus says, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. And where is the Father? Well, you all uh, know the, uh, what is called the Lord's Prayer. When you pray, you say, Our Father, which art in heaven. So where is the Father? The Father is in heaven. And Jesus is saying he's going back to the Father in heaven. And what did he say just prior to that? To his disciples back in chapter 13. John chapter 13 and verse 33. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. Jesus says we cannot go to heaven. Well then, what happens? Well, back in John chapter 11, and in verse 11, Speaking of the death of Lazarus, these things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, 
but they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Jesus says when you die, you just go to sleep. That's what he's saying. And you've all seen the signs, R.I.P., rest in peace. Well, how can you rest in peace if you're still alive in heaven and you're watching your loved ones suffer, making mistakes, doing things that you wish they weren't doing? How is that resting in peace? Jesus says you just go to sleep. Well, if we look at 1 Corinthians 15, which is commonly referred to as the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse 17, it says, And if Christ is not risen, your faith is in vain, you are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Now verse 20, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. The Bible is telling us that the dead are simply asleep and they're waiting for the resurrection. Back in Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, which is right after the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes in chapter 9 and verse 5 tells us, For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. The dead know nothing. And just uh, a little bit before that, in Psalm 146, Psalm 146 and verse 4, says his spirit departs, he returns to his earth, and that very day his thoughts perish. His thoughts, his plans are over. Now do you think and plan when you are asleep? No. And without brain waves and a beating heart, you won't even dream. Because you sleep. But you've been told you have an immortal soul. Again, what does the Bible say? Back to 1 Corinthians again in chapter 15 and in verse 50. But this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Again, what are they referring to? The kingdom of God. It's about the kingdom of God. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep. What he means is, we're not all going to die. There is coming a time just ahead of us when Christ is going to return to this earth, that people who are alive at that time, who are his, won't die. They'll just be changed. And those who are his who have died will be resurrected and changed. He says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. What did the Bible just tell us? We are mortal. He just said flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We are flesh and blood. We are mortal. That's what we are. But we will be changed. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, when? At the last trump, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? There is no victory for the grave, because the grave cannot hold you when the trumpet sounds. That last trumpet is the seventh trumpet. If you are not familiar with the seven trumpets, then I would refer you to read Revelation chapter 8 through 11, which refers to 
the seven trumpet plagues of the day of the Lord. This happens at the return of Christ. Also, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 14. He says uh, that you keep the commandment without spot, blameless until our Lord Jesus Christ appearing, which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality. Jesus Christ is the only person who was ever human to have immortality. No one else has immortality. Only Christ. That's your Bible. Now you may have been told there's a rapture. Sorry, not in the Bible. It's a handful of scriptures that are taken out of context and try to make it say something that it doesn't. But what does God say? Let's go back once again to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. He says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Tribulation, heavenly signs, day of the Lord. Do the prophets tell us this? Yes. If we go back to the prophet Joel, Joel chapter 2 and verse 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Tribulation, heavenly signs, day of the Lord. Matthew 24 and verse 31. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. That's the last trumpet, that seventh trumpet. And he will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And some will say, aha, you see there are people in heaven. Well, no. He just said you're going to see him coming on the clouds of heaven. Where are the clouds? They're in the atmosphere. They're where the birds fly. They're where the planes fly. You don't find clouds around the International Space Station. There's no atmosphere. The clouds are here. What happens is, at this last trumpet, those who are Christ at his coming will be changed and will rise. But they're going to rise from where they're at. You have people going up in China, people going up from Africa, people going up from Australia, people going up from Europe, people going up from South America, North America, and they're going up from where they're at. And so the angels are going to be sent to gather them all around the globe because they're going to rise in the clouds. And the angels are going to gather them to Christ. And that's what it means. The Bible has a lot to say. But you need to be the detective. You need to search for the clues. Look it up. Check it out. In Acts chapter 17, we have a description of what we should do, of how we should be. In Acts chapter 17, verse 10, says, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went to the synagogue of the Jews. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. 
Will you receive the word and search the scriptures and prove it to yourself? The disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? Well, Jesus presented a riddle that most cannot figure out or understand. Most of you are well aware that Christ died on Good Friday and was resurrected on Easter Sunday. But is that true? Let's look at the riddle. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and the sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus is going to give one sign to prove that he is the Son of God, who he claimed to be. He did many miracles, but he's only going to give one sign. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said he would be three days and three nights in the grave. And he gives the definition of day and night in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11 and in verse 9. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of the world. So what does he just say? The day has twelve hours of light. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. There's twenty-four hours in a day. If twelve hours are daylight then 12 hours are night and he said this at the time of the vernal equinox when as you know it is equal day equal night because it was just a matter of days before the Passover and the Passover is in the spring just after the time of the vernal equinox. So there was no argument as to 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night. They understood exactly what he was saying. Well, in Matthew chapter 11 and in verse 25, at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. The wise and the prudent don't understand it. Can't figure it out. But God says, it's simple. It's simple. Matthew chapter 16, as the riddle continues. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 21. From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. In chapter 17 and verse 22. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. The third day he will be raised. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27 and verse 63. The chief priest went to Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days, I will rise. And Mark 
chapter 8 because it's in the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word is confirmed. Mark chapter 8 and verse 31. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. So the riddle, how can he be in the grave three days and three nights, rise the third day and rise after three days? How good of a detective are you? How hard have you searched for the clues? Well, let's look at the clues. Here they are. And it is here a little, there a little, in some cases only one word. But to you, it may be given, but to them it is hidden. Mark chapter 15, verse 42. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. Was he waiting to die? Is that what it means? He was waiting to die so he could go to heaven? No. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. When you pray that prayer, our Father which art in heaven, what's the next thing you say? Hallowed be thy name. <coughs> thy kingdom come. Not, can I go to your kingdom? It's thy kingdom come. The message that Christ brought was a message of the kingdom of God that is coming to this earth and he will reign as king of kings and lord of lords. So this council member was waiting for the kingdom of God. Coming and taking courage went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead and summoned the centurion. He asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion he granted the body to Joseph. Then he uh, then he bought fine linen, took him down, wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in the tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Luke Chapter 23. Note several clues. The preparation day was the day before the Sabbath. He died and was buried. And after the Sabbath, they bought spices. Luke 23 and verse 54. Uh, verse 53, then he, they took down, wrapped the linen, and laid in the tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. Verse 54, that day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb, how the body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So, they prepared the spices, then they rested on the Sabbath. But we just read they didn't buy the spices until after the Sabbath. You can't prepare them before you buy them. So does that suggest to you that maybe there was more than one Sabbath? John chapter 19. John chapter 19 and verse 31. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day. The Jews 
asked Pilate that the legs might be broken and they might be taken away. It was a high day, that Sabbath, after the preparation day. Verse 42, So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. Verse 14, Now it was the preparation day of the Passover. So, more clues. The preparation day of the Passover. What is this preparation day? Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. As we're searching for the clues, here a little, there a little. Luke chapter 22 in verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. So the feast of unleavened bread is called Passover. John chapter 18. John chapter 18 and verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. And it was very early morning. But they themselves did not go into the Praetorium lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 17. As we put all these little clues together, Matthew 26 and 17, Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? Prepare. Preparation day. The preparation day was the day the Passover was killed. It is always and only the first and only day before the first day of unleavened bread. So, where does that take us? Back to Leviticus chapter 23 so we can understand what God is saying. Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 5. On the fourteenth day of the first month between the evenings is the Lord's Passover, which simply means late in the afternoon, 3 p.m. And on the fifteenth day of the same month, which is the very next day, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. The 14th is the Passover. The 15th is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The term Passover has been come to encompass the whole eight days. So that's why it is worded the way it is. The Passover was on the 14th. The very next day was the first day of unleavened bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and it says it is a holy convocation, a holy day, and no work, and is described as, verse 24, speak to the children of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath. And verse 32, it shall be to you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your souls on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. And verse 39. Also on the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast to the Lord for seven days. On the first day there shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day a Sabbath. All seven holy days are called Sabbaths. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians, to show that the disciples knew exactly what Jesus was talking about and what was happening. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, 
not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So, let me summarize for you. On a Wednesday afternoon, the 14th day of the first month on God's calendar, because God's calendar begins in the spring, Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried late on Wednesday, just before sunset. At sunset, the first Sabbath began, the first day of unleavened bread, a Thursday. After the Sabbath, on Friday, they bought the spices and prepared them, then rested on the weekly Sabbath that began at sunset Friday through Saturday. Early Sunday morning, they brought the spices and they found the tomb empty. Jesus was three days and three nights in the tomb. Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night, and three days, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. He was resurrected just before sunset on Saturday evening, spending three nights and three days in the tomb, rising on the third day because it was still Saturday, yet after three days because it had been just minutes after 72 hours. He was buried just before sunset and was resurrected just before sunset. If he spent Saturday night in the grave, it would have been a fourth night, making him a liar and failing to provide the only sign he said he would give to prove that he was the Son of God of three days and three nights. Look it up. Check it out. Find the clues. Now since he was not resurrected on a Sunday, and there is no command anywhere in the Bible to have Sunday worship, why not do what God says? Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. It says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. Whose day is it? Is it some religious day, some, some Jewish day? No, it's God's day. It is the Sabbath of the Lord, your God. If you believe in the God of the Bible, your God, this is his Sabbath day. In it, you shall do no work, you, nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, nor your stranger that are within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. What does that mean? When you pray that prayer, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Sacred, sanctified, set apart as holy. And that's what he did for the Sabbath day. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And in verse 27. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. So, wh which day is the Lord's day? The Sabbath. You can't find anywhere in the Bible where it says Sunday is the Lord's day. You can take out of context a verse in Revelation chapter 1 where John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. But anybody that can read can understand he's talking about the day of the Lord, that last end time period of the Great Tribulation, the heavenly signs, and the day of the Lord. That's what the whole book of Revelation is about. It's not about Sunday. 
So John chapter 14, Jesus has a commandment. In John chapter 14 and verse 15, he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. But Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. And if you're not aware of that, then just look at a few scriptures. John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse 18. says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. No one has seen God at any time. And what did Jesus say in John chapter 5 and verse 37? And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. Then who did Moses see in the burning bush? Who did Moses talk to? Who did Moses spend 40 days on the mountain with? And who wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger? No one has seen the Father nor heard his voice at any time. It could only be one person, Jesus Christ. John chapter 17 and verse 5 in the true Lord's Prayer. And now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus has always been with the Father. But he emptied himself of his divinity and became a man to die for you and me. You've seen the signs, the billboards, the ads on TV. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. Well, is that all there is to it? You see, the Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians 2.12. And that doesn't sound like much work. Just saying, well, I believe and, and I confess, so now I'm saved. What about the scripture in Mark chapter 16? Let's don't leave out the clues. Mark chapter 16 and in verse 16, where he says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. So now there's something you got to do. You don't just say, I believe. Now you got to be baptized. Well, what about the scripture in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38? On the day of Pentecost. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, now you've got to repent before you can be baptized. So once you believe, you got to do something about it. You have to repent. Then you have to be baptized. And then you can receive the Holy Spirit. Well, how does that happen? Acts chapter 8 and verse 17. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Because the apostles, back in verse 14, had heard that the, uh, when they were in Jerusalem that Samaria had received the word of God, and they sent Peter and John. And when they had come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet the Holy Spirit had fallen on none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they had done everything they knew, but they hadn't received the Holy Spirit because they had not had hands laid on them to receive 
the Holy Spirit. In chapter 19, we see another example. Chapter 19 and verse 6. And verse 5, And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. They had to have hands laid on them. Hebrews chapter 6 tells us this is part of the basic doctrines of Christ. It's not a doctrine of the church. It's not a doctrine of this apostle or that person. It's the doctrine of Christ. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles, doctrines of Christ, the basic doctrines of Christ. He says, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation, which is the basic doctrines of Christ, of repentance from dead works, of faith, which is the belief toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. These are the doctrines of Christ. This is what the church teaches the doctrines of Christ. Is there anything else you need to do? Well, Revelation chapter 2 and 26, he tells us we need to overcome. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. You see, that's what your salvation is all about. Reigning with Christ. Chapter 3 and verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. Sharing the throne with Christ. And Revelation chapter 20. And verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him a thousand years. And that thousand years is just the beginning of eternity. So I challenge you to challenge yourself and take the test. Look it up. Check it out. Find the clues. It will be here a little and there a little. Don't believe me. Believe your Bible. I took the test years ago. I set out to prove this was wrong. I bought a Bible and I bought a concordance and I began to search the scriptures confident that the majority cannot be wrong. But they are wrong. God looks at the heart. One last scripture is in Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and in verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, for I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. If you truly want to know God, if you love Him and want to please Him, then ask Him for understanding. He will look at your heart and give you accordingly. Pray and study and the light will go on and you will understand. So take the test. Check out the things that I mentioned. Heaven, hell, death, immortality, Good Friday, 
Easter Sunday, the Sabbath, salvation, and ruling with Christ. If you would like more information, uh, here's our website, www.icgchurches.org. It's I-C-G-C-H-U-R-C-H-E-S dot O-R-G, which is the gateway to the local websites of the Intercontinental Church of God. And you can scroll down, click on St. Louis, and then click on Sermons. There are over 100 sermons there on various topics, including the entire book of Acts and the entire book of Daniel. And you can go to the homepage with links to the Intercontinental Church of God, and there you will find countless books, booklets, pamphlets, and Bible helps that will keep you busy for well over a year. And you can find the link to the Garner Ted Armstrong Evangelistic Association which will tell you everything you need to know about prophecy in the news and what is going on in the news where it concerns the Bible. And also the Midwest Area 4 website with our Area 4 coordinator. Are you up to a challenge? Or will you let someone else tell you what you believe. Will you work out your own salvation or let someone else decide your salvation for you? Take the test. I hope you do. And be be uh, happy, if you will, to share this DVD and uh, make copies if you will and uh, if you would like more copies then all you have to do is write to the address at the website and we will get more copies to you but I hope that this will cause you to be intrigued to be challenged maybe angry but check it out what have you got to lose except your salvation? <laughs>